Dr. Gilbert here with a video recap of our discussion in class for the last two meetings on phylogenetics. Um, what is this about? This is about ancestry. What is our evolutionary history? From whom did we descend? So one of the important tools that we use to figure out evolutionary history is called cladistics. A uh, clade is a group and um, this tool tells us which organisms are more similar to each other and um, whom they are less likely to be related to as well. Uh, we figure out this by comparing shared traits and figuring out who has what and who doesn't have what. When we look at a platogram, which is this kind of diagram, we start at the bottom and we work our way up to what we call the node and we identify the node with a particular trait. In this first example we have jaws and remember this is where we're looking at eight different organisms and we're comparing them and to see who's most closely related to who and what we see is that uh, all of the organisms above the node have jaws but down here below the node, this hagfish doesn't have a jaw. So that tells us that all the organisms above the node are more closely related to each other than they are to the hagfish. So we can work our way and group and group up at organisms till we find out who's the most related to who. So for example here we end up with the chimps and the mice most closely related to each other. That makes sense to us. Okay. Um, what's the difference between a cladogram and a phylogenetic tree? The cladogram simply organizes similar and different organisms based on their traits. The phylogenetic tree implies time as a function of, the, time as a factor that we can read into this diagram. So in a phylogenetic tree, down here at the bottom at the root, this represents a long time ago. And as we work our way up the tree towards the tips of the branches, we get to the present. Okay. Another feature of phylogenetic tree is that each of the little nodes here or here represents not only a branching point in terms of traits, but tells us that there was a common ancestor to all the other organisms that come after that point in time. So that common ancestor developed the trait and through evolution and then passed that trait on to its descendants. So what else do we know? Do you want to summarize? Things above a node have more in common with each other than they do with things below the node, and those organisms above a node share a common ancestor. One of the concepts that we use to decide which possible evolutionary history is most likely to be the accurate one is the principle of parsimony. And this is the idea that all other things being considered the simplest explanation is most likely to be correct. Sometimes we refer to this concept as Occam's razor. And in this uh, figure here, we see um, an example where we have a blue bird and two different red birds. These are three different species of bird. And you can see by the tree that they come from a common ancestor down here at the bottom. Somewhere down here was a common ancestor. And they diverged and we end up with two red ones and one blue one. Well, which pattern is correct? In the diagram on the left, we see what we're doing here when we look at these red bars is that we are inferring that a mutation that led to red feathers occurred twice in the history of these three species. In contrast to the diagram here on the right, but we see only one red bar inferred that would explain red feathers in all of these. So the diagram on the right is more parsimonious. Why? 
because we only have to infer one mutation instead of two as we do in the diagram on the left. So what? Well, mutations are rare. Beneficial mutations are rare, as we're going to see. And so it's much less likely that two separate mutations occurred that were beneficial. Therefore, all other things being equal, we favor the diagram, the kind of uh, explanation that we see on the right, inferring fewer beneficial changes. We'll use the term synapomorphies in just a moment to explain these kinds of changes. This slide gets at some important concepts that, that we covered, um, namely plesiomorphy versus apomorphy. A plesiomorphy is an ancestral trait. In this diagram, we look at this orange-based bird, and we see that these three species of birds that are descended from it all have this trait. From their point of view, their ancestor has this particular plesiomorphy. If we look at from the point of view of this further back in time ancestor, we see that it doesn't have a face mask at all, and so therefore the formation of the face mask was an apomorphy. It was something that it's derived, it's something that its descendants had. Now, a synapomorphy is a shared derived trait, and it helps us identify clades. So what we're looking at here, this orange, all three of these orange species, orange mask species birds, all are members of the same clade because they have that common synapomorphy. A homoplasy is a shared trait that's not based on ancestry. Um, we talked about two examples of those in class. One of them is convergence, when two organisms end up with the same appearance or phenotype, but they have different ancestry. Another one is reversal, and that one we talked about particularly with respect to um, DNA sequencing and doing um, phylogenetic trees with uh, nucleic acid. We spent some time working on phylogenetic trees in class and how we would construct them. In this diagram, we see that we have four different fish with different phenotypic traits, and we consider them with respect to an outgroup, their common ancestor, and we're able to infer who's most closely, closely related to who. We can build these what they call nested clades here, and we can infer something about who's more ancestral, who's more recent, what's more plesiomorphic, what's more apomorphic, based on how we group these organisms up by their traits. So if we were building one of these trees, which one would be the most likely one that would be correct? It would be the one that we had to infer the fewest number of synapomorphies, i.e. the fewest number of bars to get all the groupings correct with all the traits present. We shifted gears to talk about something called the WIPO hypothesis. This is the idea that whales and hippos are most closely related to one another. And it addresses one of the mysteries in biology is how can it be that whales, which are mammals and live in the sea, um, have a common ancestor who's on land. Who is the closest relative of the whale? Um, one idea is that the closest relative is the hippo, which is an artiodactyl, and that's indicated by this red bar here. And if a whale is very closely related to a hippo, that means that these guys would be there in their own clade, and the whale would be a member of the artiodactyl. Okay, and the alternative hypothesis is that no, the whales are actually on the other side of that node there that indicates artiodactyls with the red bar. They're over here. They're an outgroup. What helps us decide who's an artiodactyl normally? We decide by looking at the astragalus bone, an important uh, type of ankle bone that is characteristic of artiodactyls. Well, we have an issue here, right? Because whales don't have legs, so therefore they clearly won't have ankles. So we're going to have to use other types of data to decide whether whales should be artiodactyls or not, uh, whether they should be grouped up with the hippos.
we looked at a couple pieces of data. The one that is the most important for uh, bolstering this part of the story is something called lines and signs, which are nucleic acid sequences. And when we, what we're looking at in this slide is a character state table, right? And the phenotypes here in this table are the presence or absence of these lines or signs here, i.e. the locus, the position within a genome. And the table tells us the presence or absence of a line or a sign for these different animals. Okay, And what we see here is that only the whales and the hippos have a line or a sign at position 4, 5, 6, and 7. And when we build a phylogenetic tree that takes into account all these different uh, lines and the signs, we see that we can make a clade here that captures phenotypes 4, 5, 6, and 7 all by themselves, grouping the whales and the hippos. And this is good data supporting the idea that whales and hippos shared a common ancestor. Another piece of data that is very important in the Whippo story is based on these fossils, which indicate that these organisms are indeed cetaceans, whales, um, dolphins and porpoises, and um, this is based on characteristics of their skull. Remember we discussed in class why it was that it was important to base uh, cetacean characteristics on um, identification on skulls, and partly this allowed us to use fossil data to see who was and who wasn't a cetacean. Well, if you look here, these are cetaceans, but they have legs and ankles. So they have an astragalus, at least this one does and this one does, and it suggests, wow, here's cetaceans that actually can walk around, and this data supports the Whippo hypothesis as well. So put it all together, and it lends more credence to this story that, yes, indeed, the closest ancestors um, that exist today to Whales are the hippos. And all of this is part of the larger story of how we figure out, how we use phylogenetic analysis to tell us about evolutionary history. Thanks for your time watching this. I urge all of you to review our content with somebody else in class, talk it over with them. So you get all the stories straight, bring your questions to class, and we'll be reviewing them together shortly. Talk to you soon.